Welcome back. When we last left off, I had just finished construction on an enormous experience fountain. This obviously is going to be of immense use in preparing the aluminum that I will need for my MB tier, but first, of course, I need to make the aluminum. For now, that's going to be an entirely manual process, but not for much longer. In the research I did on my previous runs of this, the documents mentioned that your first auto-crafting options become available in MV at the earliest. They are incorrect. I have actually had access to auto-crafting technology for a while, I just chose not to use it until now because there is no point, given the low XP yields of essence berries, and it requires some very expensive resources to set up. That is very quickly no longer going to become the case. I do not have the time or energy to manually manage simple projects, so we'll instead be relying on ever-increasing amounts of extremely janky automation to get things done around here. For now though, aluminum, and lots of it. And also emptying out the waste chests. This will become something of a chore for a bit until I have better item filtration methods, but we will survive. In the background, I also start upgrading my base, technology, and otherwise. I'm sitting on a glut of iron and gold, so there is no reason for any chest that I care about to be lower than a gold tier chest at the moment. I also work on circuitry construction. I still haven't forgotten that, it just wasn't a priority. Gold chests are an excellent upgrade. Unlike their wooden brethren, they store 81 stacks of items per block, making them three times as good in consequence. This upgrade lets me consolidate my storage a bunch. Gold chests also will let themselves be placed next to other chests directly, which means I can densify my storage as well. A little bit of sorting later, and my mental state is significantly improved. It also lets me increase my random junk capacity on the mob farm, which is already overflowing. Good times and good problems to have right there. I even find myself a new Kintsunagi. Excellent. In other exciting news, I have finally cleared out all of the blood from my smeltery. At long last, I'm going to be able to use my smeltery for smelting. I also get myself some more cobalt brass and centrifuge it down, again. Now that I have the EBF and the recipes unlocked, I can replicate samples of zinc and cobalt from it without an issue now. Those get duplicated, and then I now have zinc and cobalt samples at my disposal if I ever need them for some reason. And I immediately put them to good use by crafting myself up a circuit assembler. Or I would, if the crafting recipe worked. I debated cheating in the correct materials. These are LV circuits that I'm using, so they really should work. But then I remember I don't actually have to. I can just craft the microprocessors into the crafting catalyst circuit thingy that you use in multi-blocks sometimes and then craft those back into the original kind of circuit. I suspect this is just some forge tagging error on the devs part, because I am a couple versions behind after all. Either way, no dilemma, this thing is crafted in short order. I notice my boilers are degrading again, so I go ahead and preemptively replace them. Those will fill up before daybreak, hopefully, and then I can get back to processing without any delays. While that is percolating along in the background, I do some thinking. I'm going to start requiring significantly more power, and my current system of just slamming down more solar boilers is not going to cut it in the long term. For example, running a single EBF at MV voltage would require roughly 80 solar boilers, and doing the same at HV would require a truly ridiculous 320. That is after ignoring my other machine requirements. Normally, once I hit MV, I tend to progress along a rather unusual Magitek line that, while expensive to set up initially, will comfortably supply me with power early into IV without really any significant pollution or upkeep concerns at all. That is not an option here, because I don't have the ability to make some of the materials that I would use as crafting components because I can't make batteries. And that no battery thing also is kind of a separate problem. I'm used to relying on battery buffers to handle sudden surges in power demand, and that is no longer an option. My energy consumption, therefore, is strictly capped at my total energy production, period. 
If I go over that, the lights start turning off. This means I need a power production method that, in addition to being affordable, not a massive pain in the rear to automate and maintain, and scalable, at least in the short term, also has to be able to handle sudden spikes in power demand gracefully. The only- uh, ah, shoot, fire in the villager pen, stupid mob farm. This thing is usually pretty stable, but every once in a blue moon I have to go up and patch a hole or something. I have gone ahead and replaced the vines with water at this point, because that does stop the creepers from blowing up mostly, but it does not help when concussion creepers scatter mobs. Anyway, as I was saying, the only thing that I'm aware of that fits this bill right now would be steam or biodiesel setups. This biodiesel setup seems more promising, since it would let me turn seed oil and sodium hydroxide into large amounts of a very energy-dense fuel that can be freely pumped wherever I need. That fuel is then burned in combustion generators to produce power. The generators do pollute, which is not great, but LV superconducting wire is super cheap, so I could just make that some other location's problem. The first step in the desilification process is securing my material base. Steel and LV circuits are basically a solved problem at this point, Circuits require trading, which is what I'm going to get started on right now, because the construction process takes a bit, and steel just needs a smeltery to run and some maceration, both of which are trivial. Sadly, however, I will also need motors, which require a not insignificant amount of tin and copper to produce. For now, copper will just have to happen incrementally as I do my mob farm rounds. Uh, mm, side note, remember the days when I had to make arrows using wooden swords and a crucible? Yeah, that's gone now. I have so many of these things that I have to throw barrels of them over the side of my base before they clog the system up. Yeah, no idea what's going on over there, but I am not a fan. Anyway, next step is steel production speed increases. I'm throttling primarily on my ability to cast ingots out, so I triple that, and then have a little oopsie when I fill the system with seared stone instead of molten steel. It will work itself out eventually. Incidentally, constant fuel consumption on smelteries is overpowered. Another nice thing about having a mob farm? Skeleton skulls for more XP. I don't think this ever becomes relevant again, but you know, it was a nice idea in principle. The next step in this progression series is more thumbcraft research. I want to see if it's possible to make something called a dynamism tablet. It's essentially just a fancy player auto-click emulator, but it has a bunch of niche uses. It ends up requiring both nether quartz and nether bricks to make, so I will probably not be using it for a bit and instead just manually farming my seed oil. This project, by the way, is going to take a really long time. I am still firmly entrenched in micromanagement hell right now. To help with this, I do make a bigger smeltery, and that is a mighty big smeltery that I have there. Yes, am, am I compensating for something? Why, yes, I am, now that you mention it. With some of the diamonds produced fresh and hot from my mob farm, I can also finally afford chandeliers. These lock mob spawns in a 16-block spherical area, supposedly. I have tired of my water feature and desire to surround the area with chandeliers instead for reasons that are 100% unrelated to the fact that it will spawn slimes that will murder me in my sleep. And after literally three hours of flailing around, I have all of the parts I need to get this thing constructed. Let's use the power of movie magic to help skip over some of my inability to figure out what I'm doing. Ah. No, no, that is utterly pants is what it is. Let's try this again. Right. So, setting expectations. This thing is ugly. I am aware of that. In my defense, however, I can only filter items with barrels. I have no way of doubling up import and export on a side of a multi-block. And on top of that, I am cripplingly poor, so bite me. I'm also going to have to power this thing with creosote to bootstrap it. Fun. The first step is feeding a little oxygen and carbon into the carbon dioxide production. This will auto-bottle and then auto-feed into the methanol production. The second step is adding hydrogen for the methanol. This is a wasteful way of crafting the 
stuff, but I'm also breaking down the glycerin to make more methanol, and that process will net me a bunch of extra resources anyway, so I don't care. This then sends a cell of methanol into the diesel reactor, and thankfully not the electrolyzer that I forgot to temporarily disconnect. That could have been bad. The next step is seed oil. I have a walnut sapling saved from all the way back when I got it as my first fruit tree quest reward, so I plant that and spam bone meal on it for a little bit. I have basically infinite bones at this point, and the real bottleneck is just turning them into bone meal, so I am more than happy just to convert bone into seed oil at any ratio the game sees fit to give me. That then goes into the fluid extractor that pipes into the chemical reactor. While that works, I need sodium hydroxide to do stuff. In real life, I think this is supposed to help pull water out of the mixture or something, but my understanding of chemistry can quite comfortably be crammed into a Q-tip, so what do I know? I hammer out some of it and chuck it in, and it will just work magically in the background. Oh no! I need more walnuts! Say it isn't so. Go go gadget auto clicker! After I finally feed those in, I get biofuel. I do a bunch more output processing and filtering and junk that is too complicated to be worth explaining, and the end result is that everything will cycle back around for another pass, slowly filling up the system with biofuel as it goes. It isn't perfect, it isn't even good or particularly fast. I will have to manually farm walnuts for it and supply it with sodium hydroxide. I will also need to keep adding in new cells every once in a while because the system will slowly buffer itself with them as it runs. But it is a non-steam power generation system, it has a minimum of obnoxious farming procedures, and I can reliably scale it for quite a while. The bottleneck is seed oil at the moment, and that is super easy to expand production for. Just as that problem is resolved, though, a new one looms on the horizon. I am broke. Again. Making that system bled me dry of copper and tin, and even my prodigious steel reserves are starting to look a little thin at the moment. And, you know, I'm absolutely sick to death of having to deal with copper shortages. To remedy that, I set my sights on the mob farm again. Extracting steel from it is fairly simple at this point, but the bottleneck is crafting XP buckets into useful minerals, and that is something of a stumbling block. Conventional wisdom would say that there is no way of setting up autocrafting with my current level of technological development. As you all are no doubt aware, I consider conventional wisdom to be a largely irrelevant recommendation. I do my usual process of extracting anything I want to keep from the mob drop chests and then dumping the rest, but I also make sure to grab some red alloy, a diamond block, and four regular diamonds. Then, after applying a little secret sauce, elbow grease and microcrafting, it's called elbow grease and microcrafting, I end up with this. An inventory full of junk. But not just any junk. No, this junk is everything I need to fully automate copper production. Forever. The key to this little setup is something called a world interaction upgrade from extra utilities. I will spare you the details and just say that it treats a 3x3 grid of containers, like chests or something, as a crafting grid and then tries to output the results of that crafting into its item output. I can exploit this, along with a little bit of redstone timing, four stacks of buckets, a bit of copper logic, and more piping than I care to name, to create a system that will fill chests with XP buckets, remove the empty buckets to refill them, and then pause itself when the crafting might fail to create the correct item by detecting the level of XP in the tank. At least that is the theory. I've done this before with item conduits and it worked fantastic. But the implementation here is a little bit hairy, and it likes to jam itself pretty much all the time. It's also making tin and not copper, which is not what I was going for, and it does not help that I keep getting ganked by random phantasmal spiders every 30 seconds or so. The solution I come up with just ends up using hoppers to craft instead of tiny chests like before, uh, the hoppers will constantly try to feed into barrels, which filter out only for empty buckets, which means they will ignore the crafting materials I want to keep in the hopper. I can then pull the empty buckets down from the barrels directly with more hoppers. This design also makes it impossible to auto-craft certain resources like aluminum because of the shape of its recipe, but I don't really care about auto-crafting anything with that shape anyway, so it's fine. Naturally, I managed to mess this up.
These things are horribly fiddly, and it is absolutely not clear in the least which way you're supposed to orient the recipe on the grid. I get it set up correctly, and then step away for a moment to let it percolate out. And then immediately got knocked into the void by another phantasmal spider. I am beginning to question the intelligence of whoever thought this was a good mechanic to add to monsters. A little bit less spider-infused waiting to confirm that the system is working as designed, and I decide that it is working, but I want more. I happen to have gotten an enchanted book with Education 3 on it. On swords, this enchantment lets you get more experience for mobs that you kill, and this effect also happens to work on spikes. The end result is that my one pump is entirely unable to keep up with my XP production, and I am losing XP due to pickup inefficiencies. The hopper voids excess XP from orbs it picks up if it can't fit in the container, but that is a problem I like to have, and I solve it with a second pump. Even that is kind of struggling with the bigger orbs, but that's about as much as I'm going to capture, so it's good enough for now. It ends up being such a ridiculous improvement that the feeding system breaks down, buckets can't return to be refilled fast enough, and the farm ends up producing redstone instead of tin for a bit. I am okay with this, because that means its copper production is going to be amazing. And even with that blooper, I already have three stacks. I want more inventory storage. It is well past the time that I got myself some backpacks. So for that, I'm going to need drying racks to dry leather on. How many drying racks do you think I should make? Oh, that's an excellent question. I'm just going to make a stack of them. That means we need cotton, and as such, bone meal. Hmm, how much should I make? Tough question. How about an entire inventory full? Wow, that sure is convenient. A whole chest of cotton for absolutely nothing. Thanks, Mob Farm. The bit at this point, if you couldn't tell, is that you never craft one of anything in this mod pack. While I'm at it, how are my good friends in the Emerald Factory doing? Oh, very nice. Very nice indeed. A whole inventory of emeralds for me? You shouldn't have. Maybe copper production really should have happened earlier. I feel way better about my chances on this run now. After a much larger time skip than as usual, we fuzz back into focus right as I finish crafting my second round of combustion engines. It is definitely time to push towards MP proper at this point. It is taking way too long to craft machine parts, and I want me an extruder for the 100% efficient production options. I am, for now, just thumb crafting some bone meal together to fuel up my seed oil extractors. That will be changing at some point, but I don't have an easy way of automating the process at the moment, and a little bit of micromanagement never killed anyone. This round of combustion engines will be more than enough for me to put the EBF on a separate energy network and leave some left over for other projects. I don't plan on getting rid of my steam anytime soon, if ever, but there is another couple of huge hurdles looming in the distance that will require a truly pointless amount of energy to complete. That, however, is a problem for another day. For now, it's time to wire up and run myself an EBF. Finally. My first EBF project is getting lossless cabling set up. Redstone alloy is cheap, easy to make, and requires oxygen to process efficiently. For that, I will have to rely on breaking down obsidian dust, which I can't mass produce. The solution to this is a rock breaker turning redstone into obsidian in an interesting callback to that one weird bug way back in, like, Minecraft 1.2. Shout out to the people who remember that, yeah? Oh yeah, this thing needs water and lava to run. And with that incredibly nerve-wracking and probably doomed to explode at some point project placed firmly away from anything essential and plated up in a nice and non-flammable glass container, I can now make obsidian. And cobblestone, but I already have that covered, so no thank you. Obsidian then turns into oxygen at an excellent 6 oxygen per block, after some processing and co-opting the electrolyzer from the biofuel system. This then goes into the EBF along with my dusts, and easy money, easy life. It's that time again. More bone meal, more walnuts, and more power. Automating this process is starting to become a priority, but not extremely so. Not yet.
I will look into it later. I have a vision of a logical and easy to navigate production area uncluttered with heaping piles of junk. Let's manifest this. The first step is removing the auxiliary steam setup that I used to power the EBF. Don't worry, I am not throwing it away. I have plans for that later. The second step is apparently clearing out all of the fluid buildup in my machines. I don't really want to waste it, but I also don't really have any way of storing it, so I have to do a little bit of crafting. I save as much as I can and then just throw the rest away because I can always make more. After I move my machines, I pull everything out and rearrange the system to pipe all four amps of steam power into one lossless cable. I can make this sucker as long as I want, and it will function just fine. I then begin the delicate process of hanging all of my machines onto the cable in an order that only will make sense to me. I also start crafting some slightly larger chests. These can open under solid blocks, which is something that I desperately need in my life right now. And after some wrangling, I have this. A nice, mostly organized, easily traversable machine shop. More importantly, it's also an automated machine shop, because I can now queue tasks up with my hoppers. This is a life changer. It will go so far in making sure that I don't go crazy trying to organize my everything, and it is amazing. Oh, the, the Ender Creepers are just a nice bonus from the mob farm. Also, remember the days when I was desperate for copper? Yeah, not a problem anymore. No. No, not the stuff in my inventory. That's small change. I'm talking about the 28 stacks in my backpack, the 18 stacks of ingots already smelted, and the 10 stacks of ingots already sitting in the barrel. If you couldn't figure it out, it might be time to swap to tin production now. That ends up being easy enough to do. I just swap this here, and that out oh, for crying out loud. Right. There we go. These stupid things are so temperamental, I swear. It definitely isn't that I forget the correct orientation for the crafting recipe every single time that I use them or anything. My leftover 86-something levels then get turned into aluminum. Being able to drown myself in tin is fantastic, but I am going to need to progress at some point. Speaking of regression, it's that time again. Time for my base to turn into an unbelievable smog hole, that is. It's fine. I don't live here or anything. Today, I learned something new. You can automatically pipe water into your crucible. This speeds up the bone meal production process a ton and is a great quality of life thing. Wish I'd found out about it in the Stone Age instead of now. Anyway, I am waiting for grade 1 solar silicon, and a lot of it. I want a stack of MV circuits before I do much of anything in the MV age, and decide to do some research in the meantime. I feel like I am getting nowhere with this, by the way. It takes forever to do these, I finished like 60 of them, and my Thaonomicon does not look any different at all. Perseverance, right? I'm still only a fourth of the way through my silicon requirement after I thoroughly burn myself out on Thumbcraft, so I pay a visit to an old friend. Hey there... person? What have you got for me today? As it turns out, quite a lot, actually. I end up walking away from the trades with tons of crystals, a massive whack of random armor and repair enchantments, and over two stacks of knowledge shards, which was the whole point of the exercise. It's pretty good stuff. Oh, by the, by the way, did somebody place an order for enough tin to drown yourself in? No, no, no. Is this the wrong address? Okay. I guess you can have it if you want it. I can't, like, take it back. And wouldn't you know it, I am still in need of something to waste my time on. Hmm. It's a nice distraction, but I end up getting not much useful other than a bunch of steel and diamond dust from the armor that I purchase. And I still need something to waste my time on. I did the math, and it's going to take six hours for my silicon to finish up. Oh well, back to researching, I guess. Oh look, nickel. Yay. Incidentally, if you ever wonder what happens when I forget to empty out the mob farm chest, yeah, it's this. 
my first shipment of redstone comes in right before I'm going to start milking a villager for its wands. 55 stacks of redstone seems like a lot, but when I start needing to process chrome, that is going to disappear really quick. I need more. I also managed to get together 23 wands from my last wand trading villager before it asks for a trade that I don't have. Thankfully, this is not much of an issue. The mob farm will produce plenty of this to recharge one of these wands, so I just need to remember to keep an empty one on me and then use that one exclusively after the contracts run out on the rest. Since I'm going to be doing a bunch of crafting, I take a hot second to knock out the witching wearables research. This discounts are always nice to have. As an added bonus, the crafting process is only mildly agonizing, as opposed to the typical level of painfully agonizing. The first step for discounts is Thomic Goggles, not for their utility effect, just because I care about the best discount. After that, Fancy Duds follow in short order. You can already see the pile of wands that I used to craft my enchanted cloth, so this is not a cheap process, but I don't really care. After a solid dozen wands are burned, I finally have my full discount gear crafted and granting a whopping 15% reduction in prices. I also am apparently nutty enough to unlock Eldritch Research already, as evidenced by the little splash in the upper left-hand corner. And this is after minimizing warping research exposure. I am going to have to start being way more careful, though I do suspect that most of that warp is from the wand. My second barrel of redstone is filling up, so I switch it out and start making charcoal. I have plans that will require alimentum in bulk later on, and I really don't know what to do with my production capacity at this point. After a agonizingly long time, my diodes finish up crafting, and then I turn around and throw everything back into a circuit assembler. MV, here we come, in, you know, a half hour or something. My first job is to build a transformer and my extruder. The extruder will finally allow me to make everything with 100% resource efficiency, except for rotors, which are weird. The transformer is to power it. Duh. The only downside is that this machine needs extruder shapes, which require a quick, by which I mean only half hour long, trip to the smeltery and a bunch of steel and a bunch of power and it's going to tax my electrical grid something terrible when I actually use it. Those are, however, downsides that I am entirely okay with accepting, so I crack out my extruder shapes and get myself wired up. The first step of a new tier is, as always, ensuring a stable supply of base materials. This actually applies to previous tiers that I've skipped past, but I've done them so far out of order that it's kind of hard to tell. I have a stack of MV circuits, which should last me for quite a while, by which I mean the entirety of the MV age, and now I just need to secure a supply of aluminum. Normally you can produce it more cheaply with electrolytic reactions and some twilight ores. That is not an option, so I instead will be doing it the expensive way, which is just throwing an obscene amount of mod juice at the problem until it cries and hides behind its parents' legs. Material and moral superiority established, I then dump a stack of aluminum into the extruder and craft a stack of motors with the result. As with the circuits, this is probably overkill, but I don't care. And when those are done, we are sitting very comfortably in MV. Truthfully, we are really well situated to blow right through it. Aluminum, circuits, and power production are all abundant, and most of the materials in HV are ones that we can make already. We should be sitting pretty, right? Nope. Nope, nope, nopeity nope, nope, nope. You fool, you absolute buffoon, you have forgotten the one very important thing. Lenses. Lenses are to a laser engraver unit what a mold is to an extruder. They are non-consumed crafting catalysts that tell the machine which of the 20 bajillion different kinds of recipe output you want to make. We will need three for now. A light blue one, which can be made with diamonds. A red one, which can be made with either ruby or igneous crystal. And a cyan one, which needs green sapphire. The clever and Greg Tech savvy amongst you may spot a problem with that. The even cleverer amongst you We'll spot two, but the second one isn't going to be touched on until the next video. The first problem is that to create the red and cyan lenses, we will need an MV lathe. 
Diamond lenses are an exception to this rule, and you can make them in LV, which I think was an exception to help space out Thomcraft a bit, but that's strictly hypothetical. And MV Lathe needs an exquisite diamond to craft. We cannot make one of those. Period. Zero exceptions, full stop, runs that are dimension blocked, have to specifically write in a rule that lets you spawn one of those things in. The tech to craft one is inaccessible, and we don't have any way of getting diamond ore to make one the normal way. The buck stops here. Fortunately for us, and unfortunately for me, I knew this would be a problem ahead of time when I made the rules for this run. And just because we can't make one doesn't mean they are impossible to get. Deep, deep in the twilight forest buried under the mountains, there is a single special mob that has an extremely low chance of dropping exquisite diamonds. Meet the Red Cap Sapper. These guys spawn exclusively in medium and large hollow hill dungeons in the Twilight Forest. They have a 2% chance of dropping an exquisite diamond when killed by a player, and they are so stupidly rare I would not be surprised if most people just plain do not know they exist. Annoyingly, to drop their custom loot, they have to be killed by an actual Mojang certified human being. Every other option I tried does not cut it, even the stuff like a dynamism tablet, which is designed pretty much exclusively to spoof these kinds of requirements, it does not work. This is very much a mechanic that was designed with anti-cheese in mind. Naturally, I intend to cheese the living daylights out of it anyway. So, while I make myself a not doo-doo tier pickaxe and start doing things in the twilight void, let's talk strategy. Anyone who has played this mod will almost immediately be able to tell you that dungeons in the Twilight Forest are centered on a grid. Once you find one, you can find more just by following a straight line in a cardinal direction. This dungeon grid is centered on the origin chunk at 0, 0, with new dungeon chunks generating 16 chunks in each cardinal direction. But certain dungeons, including Hollow Hills, have a bit of leeway in their generation, so the visual center of the dungeon may be off a bit from where it actually spawned in from. It is, ironically, a lot like looking for the center of ore veins in Greg Tech. When it comes to specifically finding hollow hill dungeons, I have a few things working to my advantage. Biomes in this dimension are tightly coupled to the dungeons that spawn on this grid, and this can help me eliminate areas I don't need to check. If I see the wrong kind of biome, I know that a hollow hill could not spawn on that spot in the grid. Unfortunately, the biomes they do spawn in are the most common kinds of biomes in this dimension, and those same biomes can also spawn a bunch of other dungeons that I don't care about. So having a good biome is far from sufficient proof that I will have found a hollow hill location. Lick towers, which share the biome pool, are too high tier to access right now, and will be blocked by an anti-progression mechanic that looks like floating green boxes, so that will also help me skip their locations as well. Every other location, though, I will have to manually check to see if it's what I'm looking for. The way to do this is annoying, but simple. Look at what hostile mobs spawn there. The Twilight Forest has very precise mob spawning mechanics that restrict the spawning of certain mobs to specific dungeons. To locate a hollow hill dungeon's spawning chunks, we want to build a spawning platform that, when stood on, puts our head at around y equals 30, make sure that it is inside or near to the dungeon chunk, and then we can check to see what spawns to see if we have the right mob pool. Interestingly enough, most hollow hill dungeons that naturally spawn don't build their structure in a way that makes use of this custom mob spawning area. The ground floor of them is actually too low, and it will spawn mobs from the default mob pool instead. I have no idea if this was an intentional design or not, but it did make testing for this utterly miserable until I figured out what was going on. If our spawning platform creates red caps, beetles, and a bunch of different kinds of itty bitty spider, then we know we got the right spot. But too many zombies, skeletons, and vanilla spiders would be evidence that we found the wrong kind of dungeon. Finding a location with all of this is relatively simple. I get lucky and get one on my third attempt, but turning that into a proper farm is going to be something of a complicated process that I will need to work on in the next episode. As always, thank you for your time.
If you are inclined, the subscription, like, and notification buttons are still located in their usual spots for your pushing pleasure, and I hope you enjoyed.